everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Marisa Akachella is a New York Times bestselling author of the graphic novels The Big Shebang, Antenna, the graphic memoir Cancer Vixen, and just who the hell is she anyway? She's also a cartoonist for The New Yorker, and her work has appeared in The New York Times, Glamour, O, and in The Oprah Magazine. Her latest book, The Big Shebang, is a funny and very profound look at just how history is told. That is, it's, quote, written by a bunch of men about a bunch of men, unquote. Marisa is also the founder of the Marisa Akachella Foundation, which supports women with breast cancer at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Welcome, Marisa. Marisa, welcome to Bump in the Road. Give us a little bit of background on your story. Okay, so Pat, thank you so much for having me on Bump in the Road. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I actually have been cartooning for about 30 years. Um, full time. I did a book called Cancer Vixen, which is probably what I'm most known for besides the New Yorker cartoons. And that happened when I was doing a monthly comic strip for Glamour Magazine and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And my editor's second response was, do you want to write about it? The first obviously being, are you okay? What's your diagnosis? So I started documenting everything. And at the time when I was diagnosed, you know, you're not exactly doing backflips and jumping for joy when you have a cancer diagnosis. And I was walking down Hudson River Park with a friend of mine by the Hudson River. And I was wearing ratty sneakers and I was pretty depressed. And he said, so what's going on? And when I told him that Glamour Magazine asked me to write about having cancer, he said, what are you going to call it? And I said, well, I'm going to call it breast case scenario. And he looked at me and he's like, that is a terrible title. And just look at you. Your hair is dirty. You're wearing ratty clothes and dirty sneakers. You're the daughter of a shoe designer. And he said, you look like a victim. Where is my vixen? And this is one of my best friends, Bob Morris, who write, writes for the New York Times. So I thought about it. I'm like, that's really interesting. And he looked at me and he said, cancer vixen, that's what you should call it. So I went home and I drew myself as a cancer vixen. And I, had my, I pictured myself wearing killer five-inch heels and... My mantra at that point was, cancer, I'm going to kick your ass and I'm going to do it in killer five-inch heels. And that became my mantra. And I went to every chemo session with a different pair of shoes. And my mother came with me. Yeah, yeah. My mom was a shoe designer. She designed shoes for, actually, when she was pregnant with me, she was working as a designer for a Delman. And she got a phone call and there was a woman on the other end of the call and who said, can I speak to the designer? And my mother in her New Jersey accent said, I'm the designer. And then the woman said in a breathy voice, this is Jackie, Jackie Kennedy. And my mother said, what? She's like, oh, go on. And so Jackie said, no, it's really me. I'm a size 11 shoe and I can't find anything to wear. And my mother said, well, I'm a size 11. We could commiserate. So Jackie tells my mother that she needed a special pair of shoes for a special occasion. And guess what the occasion was? JFK's inauguration. And this is true. So there is my mom. She's pregnant with me. Jackie's pregnant with John John. And my mother's designing shoes for Jackie Kennedy. So that's why, to, for me, like when ever since I could remember... I've always drawn shoes when I get stressed out. It's kind of like my comfort food in a weird way. And my, when my mother was home working and designing shoes after she gave birth and I was three years old, she would do these trend reports with these great looking women wearing fabulous looking shoes, which were the shoes she designed. And I would imitate her. And that's how I started getting this drawing style. 
And when I was about eight, I got kind of bored with the women I was drawing because they really weren't speaking to me. So like I said, I'm from New Jersey and my father decided we were going to, he was going to splurge and take us away on a real vacation that wasn't like Ocean City, New Jersey, the Jersey Shore. So we went to Bermuda and we wound up in this pink elephant of a house. And in the pink elephant of, of the house were these drawings with captions on it, on them. And it turns out it was James Thurper's house, the legendary New Yorker cartoonist. Oh my gosh. I know. So I thought to myself, wow, the women that I've been drawing, they could talk. So that's when I basically started becoming a cartoonist and doing these these stories with these women. And then I forgot about them, went to art school, went into advertising. And do you ever hear of the Saturn return? You know about that theory? No, I don't. Okay. That's when you turn 29 and you kind of question your life and you, a lot of people have a career change at that point. Well, I had just turned 29 and I'm a Capricorn. I'm born on Christmas. And On New Year's Eve, I always write a list of things that I want to do for the year. But instead of of doing the list, I drew myself as that blonde bombshell that I've drawn ever since I was three with a gun in my mouth with a line over my head saying that said she was a little upset during the meeting. And that's when I realized that I should have been a cartoonist all along. And while I was in advertising that year... I, my day job was working on accounts at Jung and Rubicam on Colgate and other clients. And I would sit there and basically nod out in client meetings because I was so tired because I was working at four o'clock in the morning on my cartoons, developing my comic strip, She, which eventually became a comic strip in Mirabella magazine. And that's how I became a cartoonist. So that's my cartoon story, how I started doing it. And it's really funny that moment when I did draw myself, she was a little upset during the meeting and in, in, in my journal, I forgot to tell you that I actually lit a candle and called in all the higher spirits. And I was so excited when I drew that cart comic strip that I leaned into the candle and my hair caught on fire. So not only did I have a new career, but I had to get a new haircut and cut my hair into a shag. How did you end up drawing and writing for The New Yorker? Well, you know, I saw, I, I, we stayed at a James Thurber's house when I was eight. And if you're going to be a cartoonist, the only, I mean, if you want real, like, if you want to be legit, you got to be in The New Yorker. Like, that's really the truth. It could be the best thing that ever happened to you and the absolute worst thing that could happen to you because... You submit every week and you don't always sell. And in fact, you can go for months and sometimes years without selling, but you always, always try. So it could be like exhilarating and heartbreaking. Being a cartoonist for The New Yorker or being a cartoonist in general, it is a life of rejection because you're always going to be submitting and you're not always going to be bought. It's very, it's grueling and you just have to keep on keeping on and you have to have a very, very thick skin. As a cartoonist who's chronicling the New York scene, what goes through your head? Well, I mean, it it leads to all sorts of issues. I mean, it, you observe people and their behavior and sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's annoying. Sometimes you, you know, in the nineties, especially the there was a fashion boom and if you didn't have the right bag or the right hair or the right shoe, you you were, you weren't, you didn't get to the right party. So, I mean, it was very difficult back then when I was in my twenties and thirties. Now I could really give a flying, you know what, but you know, then when you're trying to make a mark for yourself and get into a certain groove and a certain group and be acknowledged by your peers and be part of that group. It's, it was difficult. You know, you have, again, like you have to have a thick skin. So, and also you have to learn for me, it was good to be a cartoonist because I learned how to not take things so seriously, even though I kind of was, but I kind of wasn't at the same time. Like for instance, I did this 
cartoon, one of the cartoons that I'm really known for in the New Yorker was Fendi Bag Lady. And it's a woman in front of a Fendi store, right? And um, she's barefoot. She's standing on top of a Fendi shopping bag. And she has a sign that says, need matching shoes, please help. I've seen that cartoon and it is so spot on. Thank you. So, I mean, that was that was New York in the 90s, for sure. The late 90s, early 2000s. What's New York like right now? A bit different than the 90s, I bet. Oh, it is really different. Um, I actually moved out of New York in September. I was living in Midtown, and I have to be honest, it... It, it got kind of scary. There were four homeless shelters surrounding the apartment building that I was living in. And um, it, it was kind of scary. I had a, a bit of an episode with my 11-year-old nieces. We got threatened and followed. So the police told me to be careful of being stalked. And I just decided I wanted, I wanted to leave. And I moved to Jersey City. I wanted to get a bigger place and a cheaper rent anyway, and rents were going down in everywhere in New York City except the building I lived in. So it kind of worked out for me. And I actually have a beautiful apartment and I overlook the marina and the Statue of Liberty. So Jersey City is fine. I mean, I really love it here. Um, I love New York too, but I feel like I did live in New York for a very, very long time. I needed a change. So the thing is, though, during this pandemic, I don't know anybody who's really happy or where they are or where their lives are at this point. I mean, where everybody's in flux. Do you remember that wonderful New Yorker cartoon where you're in Manhattan looking out across the rest of the country? I can't remember who drew that. Oh, yeah, that was um, Steigman. Uh, I think it was Stein. Yeah, I'm like... Sorry, I I have only I think I'm a little bit on overload, but yeah, I love that cartoon. It was a cover. It was that's great. If you could redraw that cartoon now, what would it look like? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't really think New York is the center of the universe anymore. You know, at all. I feel like you know, here's the thing. I think that the coastal, you know, New York and Los Angeles, I think they kind of tend to forget that there's a middle of the country sometimes. And I'm like not down with that attitude. I th- I'm a little more inclusionary than exclusionary. You know what I mean? COVID is changing our world. More than COVID, I worry about the fallout of COVID and what it's doing to everybody mentally, you know, not just physically. I really worry about the children and the elderly most of all. Yeah, that is a real, I mean, it is a global bump in the road. My, I grew up in kind of an unusual childhood because my father was a pharmacist who was also had a doc, who also has a doctorate in nutrition. So we've always been, took the offensive in terms of our health. And I've always had a vitamin regimen and I've been on this vitamin regimen now that Dr. Mercola and a lot of other holistic doctors recommend, which is quercetin, vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc. And I have to say like, I'm usually the first one who gets the flu or a cold and I've been pretty okay. I think being proactive is really important. Uh, I look at what I call our matrix, the decisions that make up our everyday lives. And I think that if we can be more conscious with the daily decisions we make, it can have a profound impact on our overall health. Well, I mean, I do think that the number one killer is stress, which leads to everything, which leads to, and, you know, there's inflammation and which also can lead to cancer, certain cancers, right? Cancer is inherently inflammatory. I know in terms of stress management, I've turned to meditation. I think it's very important to do that or find some kind of peace or some kind of way to balance yourself and, 
and connect with your higher self or the spirit or whatever you want to call it, or the divine, and go through your day, make, but making that connection first. Otherwise, I know for me, if I don't, things go kind of haywire. Your books have a strong spiritual component, and your words really hit home. I think that's crucial because you can build relationships and you could have a great friendship for 20 years. And then if you say something reactive and something hurtful, that could do so much damage and undo the work you've done for, uh, for those 20 years in a second. So I think about that a lot. Words can heal or hurt and they can connect us as well. I think your writings um, often connect to a sense of a higher power. Well, that's really true. I feel that um, I think it's really important for me to be connected to some some kind of divinity. And I wonder if if it's because, you know, having a cancer diagnosis like breast cancer, and then I also have had melanoma twice, so that's three times. And I just have to believe, I do believe there's something else. And it just made me think about how finite our time is on this planet and how it's important to try to do the right thing. You ever hear this theory, service to self versus service to others? You know about that? STS versus STO? Tell me about it. Okay, so service to self, and that is like, I come first. It's all about me. I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't care about anybody else. And, you know, you could do whatever you want, but I'm going to do what I want. And it's a very selfish service to self. It's very selfish. It's a very selfish state of mind. I kind of feel like before my cancer diagnosis, I was like that. And I think after having cancer, I really thought about my behavior and thought about who I was as a person and what kind of mark I wanted to leave on the world and what, who, how I would, would I leave this planet better than how it was when I got here, just to do something, some kind of shift and try to come from the service to others kind of mentality and think about other people and think about what I write and what I'm putting out there on the planet. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.